Please put your hands together for Eve Peters on stage. <laughs> test, test. <laughs> Hello. So this is kind of new for me because usually I talk at typography conferences and design conferences. Um, first, I'd like to know um, how many of you have had a formal training in typography, some kind of like theory or like graphic design course, whatever. Okay, yeah, it's pretty good, pretty good. All right. So, oh yeah, they're reconnecting my sound. All right. Um, the talk I usually give is about selection of typefaces, and I'm going to start with that, a short overview to get the feel of what we're going to be talking about later. Um, I write about typography on the, the font feed, mostly. It's a blog financed by a font shop. And um, there are different topics that, are, um, that I write about, but what personally interests me a lot is the a selection process. How do people choose which typeface that they are going to use? And as the talk I give um, also in the art schools and the students and everything. Because there is a lot of li literature about how, how to actually use typefaces. But the first, very first step, how do you decide which typeface you're going to use? Unfortunately, there is not so much uh, literature about. And we often get uh, questions from people that say, uh, they ask specifically to convey a certain emotion or a certain atmosphere with typography. And they ask us, is there a list? Are there lists? Is there some kind of literature around it? And uh, unfortunately, there's not that much. The problem, of course, when you're going to select type is that there are uh, a lot of typefaces on the internet. And um, you have uh, free typefaces, you have commercial typefaces, we have typefaces that are automatically um, uh, installed when you install software, so the bundled ones, you have open source, you have all kinds of different typefaces. And in fact, there are hundreds of, hundreds of thousands. And uh, the first per I'm sh person I'm showing here is Massimo Vignelli. That's an uh, um, iconic graphic designer, Italian, that um, emigrated to New York. And um, he says that having so many typefaces is limiting. You don't need that many typefaces. He said, well, all you need is five, five good ones. You can construct a whole body of work of graphic design with just five typefaces. The ones that he always mentions are these five. Oh, this is a, a Dutch uh, saying, so I don't know if it translates well. When we use the saying, a coat hanger means that every single thing that you do, you can put on the same coat hanger. You always use the same trick. Um, but he cheats already, because often he says, yeah, you need these five, but then suddenly there's Clarendon instead of Bodoni, there's a Century Schoolbook instead of Garamond, so he already cheats a little bit. So, and then we have the other extreme, and that's um, Eric Spiekerman, who I'm standing in for. He was supposed, oh, he was not supposed, but he wasn't going to come, but unfortunately he had to go to Hong Kong. So I'm standing in for him. And, and he, um, he says, all right, um, there is a reason why there are so many typefaces, because you can, uh, in fact, do a whole body of work with just five typefaces, but nobody says that my typefaces, my five, have to be the same as your five. So there is, like, there is a need for biodiversity. You can also uh, say there's a need for typo diversity. So, and uh, that's one of my favorite quotes by Bream, that's also a type designer who just basically says, yeah, each typeface has its own voice, its own atmosphere, so there is a reason that there are so many. And that's the classic example by Spiekerman that says, if you're at the crossroads and you see the stop sign, it doesn't command you to stop, it's just a totally different atmosphere, a totally wrong message that gets carried out just by the shape of the characters. So, again to the first slide, selection of typefaces. Um, there are so many, so how do you go about it? Well, as a... Uh, we all know any complex problem is best subdivided in uh, uh, part problems. So when you wake up in the morning and you want to, uh, yeah, you want to get dressed, you don't just pick out something. You first you ask yourself, okay, is it spring? Is it uh, autumn, winter? Uh, maybe you listen to a weather report. Is it going to rain? Is it going to be warm? Do you need to go to your job? Is it a free day? So that all Taking that into account, you subdivide your choices until you're presented with one last single choice, and then you can simply go, 
all right, this is the one that I like. I feel like wearing blue or red or whatever. So that's only, so actually the saying that you're using a certain typeface because you like it, because it's beautiful, that's the wrong way to go about it. That should be the very, very last step in your whole thing, a process. So, that, to explain to students, I usually use the, the four steps method. First is the formal aspects. Uh, I can't go into it because it's like way, way too long. Uh, but basically, you try to f figure out by observing the typeface if it's been made for uh, headlines, if it's refined or if it's sturdy and it's more for texts, if it's like for business communication or for a poetry book. So the actual shape of letters can you already tell you something about the intended use because most typefaces were designed with a specific use in mind. So as a user, it's a good thing to try to learn to decipher all those shapes and to find out what certain typefaces were designed for. Of course, now we also have the functional criteria uh, especially now since 2000, open type. So now we have typefaces that can do a whole lot. Uh, so you have to know, for example, if you're designing for, let's say, a newspaper, um, you need uh, big headlines, but sometimes it's only one word, so you need a wide typeface to have that one word fill the whole space. Sometimes you have several words, so you have it very condensed, so you can choose to have a typeface with lots of different weights and widths. You can choose for typefaces that speak our languages, for example, a pan-national company may have a brochure that needs to be translated to, to Cyrillic alphabet or to Greek, so it's good to have one typeface that also has all the other um, alphabets in it. So these are more technical criteria. Now what interests me most is like the two other ones, and that's first of all the historical context. Every type design is a child of its time. It has been designed in a certain time period, but also has sometimes been designed to evoke a certain time period. So if you want to, uh, I don't know, uh, design a, a book cover for an Art Deco uh, exhibition, you may want to go for genuine Art Deco typefaces or a modern interpretation and so on and so on. And the thing that's most interesting and what we're going to look at now, especially for the movie posters, it's like the cultural references. There is a cultural layer. Type doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's part of the world around us. So there's always some connection, either in the shapes themselves or in the associations that, that we make. And I'm going to show three short examples to try to explain what I mean with this. Because you have to realize um, the shapes of the characters convey a meaning that may be opposite to the actual words that they used to spell out. And I saw a great talk by John Tan in the audience at Ampersand who was talking about the lizard brain, that we have an instinctive reaction to character shapes. And uh, I also have a similar um, example that I always show. This is because you s this is lovely, but when you read the words, of course, it's the total opposite. So you s hear, you see that there is some kind of tension between the, the shape and the meaning. Same goes here. People with kids know what what movie this comes from. Um, so you can immediately see that it's not just the words that are spelled out in letters, but also the letters themselves that convey certain meaning, certain atmosphere, certain a reference. Three short use cases. First of all, Helvetica. I think that everybody knows it. That's uh, it's not the copy of Ariel, it's the other way around. Um, there's been a documentary made uh, in uh, 2007 by Gary Hustvedt. I recommend you see it because it's not only about that one typeface, but also gives an overview of graphic design, the second half of 20th century. It's a real eye-opener. And it's, it's a very interesting story, actually. So um, Helvetica, where it comes from, it was the typeface of the modernist movement, international movement. Um, we come out of the Second World War, the whole world has been at war, and uh, the graphic design community artists, they feel that these, uh, these horrible events have been uh, caused by cultural differences. So they are trying to evolve a new uh, graphic language. What they are trying to do is that to, to remove all kind of 
um, cultural or national um, references out of the graphic design. So they're looking for a very clean, very um, basic kind of graphic design. And to achieve that, they also look for typefaces that have no no reference to certain time periods, to certain cultural. And they start using Accidents Grotesk, which is a German typeface from the 19th century, one of the first sans serifs. Because it has the absence of all these serifs and all these decorations, there are none of them. So they see it as some kind of skeleton. This is the pure letter form. And seeing its success, the Neue Hache Gisserei, um, there's also a version of that type of typeface, and they create Helvetica. And so Helvetica was created to be the everyman's typeface, so that everybody could use, from the poorest person to the richest person, for any country, any culture. So um, it's a, supposed to be really ne neutral, and it is in the beginning. So end of it's uh, designed, uh, released in 1957, 60s, very popular. And, uh, but what happens then is so popular that all these big companies keep picking it up, and, they, and it's get used for the, the graphic identity of all like banks and um, and insurance companies and the big car companies and and, and, the, and the airplane companies. And so what we see gradually is that cultural um, connotation of a typeface is not something fixed; it's something that in flux. And we see over the course of like 20, 30 years that more and more this typeface that was supposed to be like the neutral, the, the every man's typeface, becomes the typeface of capitalism. And we'll see then there is a big counter movement in the late 80s, early 90s. So this is one of the f prime examples of how what we perceive as certain um, um, cultural connotation is A, not fixed, B, can also change from, from uh, culture to culture. Another one here is uh, the black letter that was originally like associated with extreme right and then suddenly started popping up in the mid-90s on R&B album covers. It's very interesting. It's, uh, it comes from a uh, fascination of the um, south of the United States, the gangs, with, uh, they have like all, most like Latin American gangs. Uh, there is a very strong black letter culture in Mexico, and all these gangs use these black letters to put tattoos on, on their body to like show honor and, and like friendship and, and like the, these values that they hold so high. And then in rap music, there is also the sub movement is a uh, gangster rap. And because they recognize these shapes on their bodies, they also start using them in their, well, it's not really graphic identity, but their graphic language. And so more and more of these uh, black letters appear on their record covers. And then the last step to make a transition from one extreme to the other, um, R&B music, which at that point has lost most of its street credibility because it's very commercial. They want to regain some of that street credibility and they invite all these gangster rappers to like guest on their albums. And this is how then uh, finally in mid 90s that we have all these black letters popping up on black entertainment music. That's, uh, that's also a very important cultural shift. Of course, you have to be careful with cultural references in typography, because if you ever asked to uh, do an identity for, uh, let's say, a uh, Chinese restaurant or some Asian import company, you'd better not use Mandarin, because then you're actually quite insulting to those people. You have to realize that these typefaces were designed um, in our deco, deco period, around the 1920s, when they were also making advertisement for uh, soap with a black kid and white kid and white kids that you didn't wash well enough and stuff. So the whole framework when it was designed was completely different from now. And so you have to be very conscious that whenever you try to uh, use some cultural reference in, in your type work, that you have to be uh, sensitive for uh, the the client's needs. For example, you can infuse some kind of orientalism in typography by using more typefaces that look like they were almost painted by brush, but still have the, the conventional shapes. Or maybe even like brush scripts. This is a funny story. It's Gizmo by Nick Cook, and he actually drew it simply as a script. But I have this book about uh, Asian calligraphy, and it actually it's South Korean uh, um, cursive script. So without knowing, he made a perfect tool for a graphic designer to be using some kind of uh, Eastern connotation without being insulting. Same goes to for for this type kind of typeface where you actually look at the basic structure and try to find a contemporary or a new interpretation for these shapes. 
So this was a short introduction. I hope uh, I didn't bore you too much. It's just to show what can be done with typography, and this will be crucial to understanding some of the things I'm going to explain about uh, movie posters. Um, this actually, this talk is a bit an extension of my series um, of um, posts that I do monthly. Um, when I was invited by Fontshop Benelux originally to write for their blog, I was thinking, I'm, I'm just a regular graphic designer, so I don't have any like uh, fancy de professor degree or what. I just use type, and I'm really in love with it because it, the 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 craft uh, aspect and 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 the almost mathematic aspect uh, speaks to my rational side, and the more the art aspect uh, speaks to my emotional side. It's a very fascinating topic. So um, um, I was thinking, how can I? get people uh, involved and, and enthusiastic about typography. And I thought maybe I'd better use um, things that people know in everyday life and try to, yeah, I see people are trying to find out all the movie posters that were uh, taken from, it's like old famous movies, and, uh, and use that. So what I did, uh, the first thing, the actually the very first post I did on, uh, oops, yeah, I come from, yeah, sorry. I come from a type ID background. I'll just skip that one. Let's say I can identify most typefaces on site. That's why I started with this thing. Um, so the very first post was uh, screen fonts. Yeah, it was originally in, in Dutch. I'm from Belgium, as you can tell from a funny accent. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I was looking, I still am, every month at movie posters, and I see what typefaces are used on the posters, and I try to comment on the choice of typeface. And movie posters are very um, good material because every movie, there's a story behind it. I mean, they're trying to tell a story which is, has a certain like time frame and certain themes, and it's interesting to see if people the graphic designers, the communication companies succeed in conveying the correct atmosphere both in their graphic design of, of, of the poster and in the choice of typeface. So that was immediately uh, quite a big hit. And when I poured it to the font feed, I was um, invited by a speaker man to start working for Font International. And um, that is so uh, since yeah, 2008, I'm doing uh, the same series on the font feed, and it's monthly. I just published one Saturday in anticipation of today, so if you're interested, you can always check it out, fontfeed.com, it's at the end. So looking at those movie posters on a monthly basis, of course, it's fascinating because there's a whole new world that opens up. I'm not from the industry, but looking in from the outside, you start to notice certain patterns, you start to appreciate certain things. For example, one of the things that really fascinates me are the alternate posters. Um, often posters come not only in uh, localized versions, so for example, if an uh, American movie gets issued in France, uh, sometimes they just change the title to some French title, but sometimes they even change the design. And so, there is also um, uh, something like um, posters that are made specifically for, for uh, um, film festivals. That somehow they are different. I mean, even sometimes different posters for the US market and British market. So behind every movie, there can be more than just one poster. Some of them have even 20 or like big productions have lots of different posters. And there are graphic designers who are also like more uh, actively um, busy with these things, like for example, these are the four alternate posters for Black Swan that make quite a, uh, yeah, they were quite uh, blogged about last year. It was by La Boca, a UK uh, graphic design company, who was asked to do one alternate poster, but then in the end they did four because it was so successful. And you can see that they have more freedom and they start to, they, they incorporate more like, this is a more art deco, the, to the left is the regular poster. Then there's also like people from outside, like this is uh, Chris Ware, my, uh, one of my favorite um, comic book artists and writers who did two posters for Savages and for, this is, I think it's uh, some Malaysian movie or something like that, it's free. And he does his own lettering, it's brilliant. So you discover all kinds of different things in, 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 uh, 
And then there's also like uh, students that actively work with, with posters. That's really funny. Um, this is, for example, Eight Films in Black and Red by Oli Moss. That was a student, and he started doing this series, and it was so successful that now he's being asked uh, by uh, by like production houses and and and, and like uh, when they do festivals to do special film posters because this is these are people that also you see that they they grasp what the movie is about and they start they try to find new images but just very conceptual for example this here um, about the Charlie Chaplin who plays both the the, the poor I think he, he's a tailor or what and then the dictator and then um, you have this as well. This is then more like trying to locate the key scene of the movie and making, building the post around that. For oh, example, um, everybody who has seen Rain Man knows what this, uh, the toothpick scene is all about. Um, another one who does really fun work is uh, Spacek, Mitch Ansara. He, did, he reworked movie posters as if they were like old books. Uh, you know, novelizations of uh, movies that he had found somewhere, so he aged them and everything. It's really funny. And again, he, he here, for example, he just use, uses the, the, the movie title, Labyrinth, and he tries to find this kind of pseudo-modernist solution for it. Um, this is brilliant, for Highlander. <laughs> and, this, and this whole series, you should check it out. It's really fun. It's really fun. Uh, and then you have um, um, another person, Victor Hertz, who does a pictogram movie poster. So he goes like, there is this database with uh, standard pictograms that they use for everything from airports to whatever else. And so Jaws become this uh, giant goldfish trying to gobble up a swimmer. And there's also like this brilliant one for Tron as well. This one I like as well. So three elements. <laughs> So he has the knife element, and then shower element, and the bathrooms, and he combines them, and he has a new poster for a psycho. And uh, these are really worth... Actually, these are also... I reported about them on the phone feed, so if you go there, you can also find these with links to their whole galleries, and it's really very much fun to... Uh, to uh... And then another thing that you start to notice, of course, when you see all these movie posters, is that sometimes, yeah, movie posters look like. So that was one of the ones, like, hey, Rambo and then Robin Hood is like a very similar thing. And then something gets even more similar that you get like, you start to wonder, was it for the same movie or not? But then um, the episode that just published Saturday, this is great, it's perfect timing, um, has this one. And of course, I think that most of you recognize uh, this one. Can anyone say which movie this is from? Yeah, but uh, the, the classic pose, the poster, is from a famous Western that got lots of Oscars. Unforgiven by Clint Eastwood. All right, I'll show you. See, see? And then, just last week, and this is serendipity, I discovered a guy named Christophe Courtois, and he is a film distributor, a French film distributor, and uh, he's a bit like, yeah, a bit crazy like me. And he also does research, but he gathers posters that use the same language. And he doesn't say that all these posters copy the other ones, but it's more like these are people that understand the graphic language, and they understand, because he is a film distributor, so he thinks as a film distributor, what kind of image they have to use to like sell a movie very effectively. So then he assembles all these posters, and you can see that some posters get reused all the time, and that you see that, for example, this one from the back with three-quarter head and some weapon concealed. So you already know about what movie, what the movie will be about. Uh, here's the same thing, all the eyes <laughs> we had before. Action movies in black with flames, and then the running people. So it's, it's really interesting to discover all these kind of themes that are recurring. But more than just the overall, the overall uh, image, there is also purely typographic uh, uh, meaning. Um, if I show you this, and I don't ask you for a specific movie, but for a genre of movies, I, I suppose that everybody knows what kind of movie this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but okay, this is, of course is for comedies, because of course you have seen it before, and before. And before, so there's like lots and lots of these. So they have also these kind of typographic codes, and 
I know I'm sometimes unkind about the, about the production companies that they one trick ponies and they always use the same shit and then they're actually, they must have noticed after a while like, oh, they're onto us. Everybody has understood that we always use like big red type for comedies. So they were very clever and they changed the whole thing they were going. <laughs> Yeah, I added the Smurfs, I know it's cheating because they are blue already. But then there's also like for the action movies I was showing, that's for example a typeface that's always used over and over again for anything from speed to the Fast and Furious Ghost um, Gone in 60 Seconds. These things are more like the, the heavyweight action movies where people are shooting each other and, and like kicking each other's ass. And then I think that, does anybody recognize what this could be? Yeah, romantic comedy. And the fun part is that romance not only has this, this one typeface that they always use, but also a certain style, a specific recognizable style. These are these movies with horizontal bands. Like, this is difficult because actually there is four posters, but it's difficult to see where one poster ends and when the other one begins. Because it's always like this, and then one, the man in there and the woman in there and all these Bodoni type, Dido type uh, typefaces. There's also more of these, these romantic comedies, for example, the one that are back to back, and you know they're going to be fighting a bit in the beginning. And then there's yours. And these, yeah, these, then there's also the, the, the movies that do false advertising because you think you're going to be going to get sex, but it's a lot of talking actually. It's not no sex at all in these movies. So it's, uh, This is more like the, 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 the historic romance and everything. And then you would think, all right, but then you still have the independent movies. So these are independent. They should have like not a unified style. Well, they do have all, its, all the letters are drawn by hand for all these like independent comedies. And it's even worse because they even have a, a color code because most of them are yellow. So these things come back and always reappear. It's always fun to like discover these things and, and like uh, um, examine what's going on. Now there's one typeface that I don't know if you know the Honey Badger uh, videos, but like they don't care, they don't give a shit. That one typeface is Trajan. And so yeah, that's the main part of my talk: the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. So there is some saying in uh, Hollywood and in uh, the production companies, and actually it was told to me by somebody who worked there, and he says like, they have this saying, make it Oscar material. And when they want to make it Oscar material, they use Trajan. For some reason, they think it will work. Now, where does Trajan come from? Uh, in, in the late 80s, um, the, the digital type business was starting to, to grow. And we had all these foundries, like Linotype, Monotype, all the old foundries who were digitizing their typefaces that existed either as metal type or as film type into digital format. There was one Maverick company called Emigre, I don't know how many of you know them, who made specifically typefaces for the computer screen. He said, it makes no sense to try a garment with all these pixels, let's make typefaces that are made for these pixels. So, but then other companies started also to produce original type. One of them was Adobe who did, of course, the, the software, but then they thought, well, we do this graphic software, you might as well um, also sell typefaces to, to work with them. So they appointed Sumner Stone, which is an iconic type designer, who hired two people, Carl Twombly and Robert Slembach. And then uh, in 89, they had the first release, and I think like, most of these typefaces are known by uh, uh, many graphic designers. And you see amongst them, there is one typeface by Carl Twombly, that's called Trajan, and we're gonna look at that one. Um, Trajan, where does it come from? It's from uh, Rome. There's uh, the Trajan's column in Italian, it's Colonna Traiana or something like that. And it, is, it was erected to uh, commemorate the victory in the Dacian Wars, completed in 113. And what it has, it has this whole like engraved, like the, the whole scene about the war. And at the bottom, there, are, there is uh, a text. Uh, inscribed in, 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 uh, in the stone. 
And as you can see, this is a photograph of the actual Trajan column, and underneath I put the digital typeface, and I resized it and spaced it, and you can see it's almost identical. It's very beautiful, it's very elegant, there's almost no straight lines. It's as if some, something between um, painting by brush and, and like carving in stone. It's, it's really, uh, really uh, very elegant. Now, there is this saying, so make it Oscar material, and everybody goes on, yeah, but Trajan is the movie poster font. It's used on all these movie poster fonts. Now, I have problems with people saying that because there are so many urban myths that people, somebody says something and nobody checks it, and then they keep on saying it, and then everybody thinks it's true. So uh, I thought I wasn't going to take any of that, and I was going to, uh, to look if indeed that was true. So this is only... This is not really scientific for three reasons. First reason is Rosa Lux. Second reason is Trouble Man. And third reason is my family. So what you will see now is not really scientific. I did a lot of research, but I mean, I'm only human. There's only 24 hours a day, so I've done a fair, fair amount of work, but uh, don't shoot me if afterwards uh, it turns out it's not entirely correct. So how do you research the usage of a typeface? Now with Trajan, it's quite easy that you know that it's been designed in 1989. So actually that makes a very neat two decades that I had to, uh, to uh, look at. So the first thing I needed to do was to find some kind of resource, a database or whatever, to find all the movie posters that hadn't been made between like 1989 and now and see if Trajan was used on them. Unfortunately, there is no international society for movie poster design or whatever, so I had to look around. First thing I found, of course, was IMDb. Well, I found I knew it already. The problem with IMDb is that um, um, with every uh, entry, there's only one poster. There are links to other posters, but there's like many clicks. So if you have to do all those years, all those movies, that's not really practical. Uh, one extra problem is that the poster, the main poster that is used, is often also the DVD version, and that can already have changed. So I, I don't want to use that one as reference. I want to really to have the original designer that said, I want to use that typeface for that movie, a conscious decision. This is a movie that uses Trajan. The next step, that's the other resource that I always use for my posts, is the Imp Awards, Internet Movie Poster Awards. And there at the top, at the right, you see year. So you can actually click here and select a year. So I had possibility to look at all the posters that were done per year in alphabetical order. This is my starting point. This was the first. Uh, now you have to realize these are all um, uh, thumbnails, uh, 100 pixels high, 65 pixels wide. So it's not very easy to see which typeface is using it. You can already quickly see if there's a lowercase. Trajan has no lowercase, so that's out of the question. If it's a sans serif, of course not. And so there's already some kind of um, uh, selection going, but you have to realize that you often will click on a poster that is not Trajan. So that's the very first use that I found in 1991. It's logical. I mean, a typeface isn't, is almost never instant it has to like appear on the market, be picked up by someone. Usually you have the influential designers and then there's the, the people that watch these influential designers pick it up and these are popular and then everybody else. So it's like a, a, a drop of oil on water. It just starts somewhere and suddenly it can spread. You never know, you can't predict how popular uh, a typeface will be and how it will evolve. So 91, it's admittable. I mean, I didn't find any usage before that. So as I explained, uh, 100 by 65 pixels is small, so often I clicked open posters which looked like Trajan, but they were not Trajan, so I did dismiss them. So I was starting work, so I thought, all right, 1991, 14 pages, a total of 289 thumbnails, yeah, must be doable, times 20, yeah, it's okay. Problem is, by 2009, I was like 75 pages of thumbnails of 165, so there were a total of uh, over 1,500 thumbnails. So in the end, for the two decades, I ended up looking at 16,000 thumbnails. And then I understood why, when I announced on Twitter I was going to do research, everybody said, oh yes, do it, do it, do it, because nobody wants to do that. <laughs> so we're like, I want to know, I want to know. I say, of course you want to know, nobody wants to like research all that. And then, of course, there's an additional problem. 
I wanted to have really the conscious decision of a graphic designer who said, for this movie, the original movie logo was designed in Trajan. Now, Trajan, I'll explain later on, having become some kind of the standard font, it gets used as an afterthought. For example, in this example, um, the fifth element was originally a French movie with a custom designed logo. So I think that the American version, or English version, uh, was redone with Trajan maybe because it it fits more the audience or is easier, I don't know. But then I chose not to include this poster because every time the original one was not Trajan, I didn't include the adapted version. The other way around, so if the original, uh, if the English version was the original and not used Trajan, I would not use the, all the adaptations that may use Trajan. And same goes for DVD covers also, because it has become some kind of the standard font. The original poster not being Trajan, I didn't count those. Uh, and then the last problem, of course, was at some point, um, all these posters are gathered by end users, so the database is not complete, is as complete as it can be, but they're also posted without any reference. So here I found as many, for example, uh, posters for the Wolfman that use Trajan as the other one on the right is much more uh, appropriate for the for time period and everything. So I don't know. So sometimes I picked it, sometimes I didn't pick it. So that's also one of the reasons why this uh, research is not scientific at all. It's like uh, uh, my best shot. But so uh, in the end, I managed to gather for tw over 20 years 400 posters. 400 posters that used Trajan as the main movie logo typeface and uh, as the primary, I mean, not any adaptations or whatever. So the first time it's used in 1991, there's only one poster. Then in 1992, there's four posters. Now I want you to pay attention to the bottom poster, Al Pacino, Scent of a Woman, because that's going to play an important role. Then we have yeah, three posters in 93. And then suddenly, boo, it starts growing. Suddenly, it becomes really popular. And when you see it in a graph, it looks like that. Now, what happens in 1992? Uh, Scent of a Woman gets nominated for a, a truckload of Oscars, and uh, Al Pacino wins one for Best Actor. I don't know if, if it has any relationship, but it's funny that after that moment, suddenly it starts really like, growing. Um, I was in talks with uh, people from the entertainment industry, amongst them uh, Corey Holmes, which designed the Sopranos logo, you know, with the R, that's the gun and everything. And he said I might as well uh, call my talk um, the first to be second, because that's how these uh, design companies and these uh, movie production studios work. They look at what's popular. They, want, they don't want to be first. They, want, they want to take the risks. But they check what's, what works. And when they see something that works, then they are the first to be second. And they want to be there when it starts to really grow. So that might be an explanation. Now, I also uh, had uh, email conversations with uh, uh, David Lemon from Adobe. And funnily enough, he explained certain jumps in the graph. The first thing that happens, uh, Trajan was originally released as a PostScript typeface. I'm not going to explain the difference between PostScript and OpenType. Let's say that PostScript is like the videotape, and, uh, and uh, OpenType is like the Blu-ray with all the trimmings and the special uh, things going on. So what happened in 1999, um, Adobe uh, converts most of his typefaces to open type, and it happens in 1989 that Trajan is converted. So you see like a climb. I don't know if it has any relation. I'm just showing what I found. I don't know. My, my mother is a mathematician, and she says it's bullshit because it's, there's not enough to be representative, but it's funny to see that there are things that might. So what happened there is that small caps are included, also different type of numeral styles or languages can be done, so maybe that accounts for the first jump. What's more important, and that also explains a bit what makes typefaces popular, is that in uh, 2005, Trajan is bundled. It's bundled with Creative Suite 2. Not with the whole system-wide uh, Creative Suite. It's, I think it's only Illustrator, maybe InDesign. So two of the programs. So what happens is that people that 
buy um, Illustrator or InDesign, they suddenly have the typeface. They don't have to purchase it anymore. Uh, so that is, of course, uh, could be an explanation of the sudden increase in popularity because it's already on their computer, so they, why not use it? And uh, same jump here in, uh, in 2007 when it's system-wide. Then the whole Creative Suite has a Trajan as a standard typeface. So this may account to those jumps in popularity. And as I explained, like, this typeface is, can be applied to any genre of movie. In the beginning, it was mostly like the inspirational movies, like the big, oh, sweeping, uh, epic things, like uh, uh, based on true stories and the incredible story and so on, but also period pieces. Uh, you find them everywhere, uh, the big like war stories and... Uh, then also the, the sweeping love stories. And if you look at the top there, you see that there's something happening, and there is even a genre that's the floating heads with people on the beach, that you know for sure that you have to take out your handkerchief because somebody's gonna die, be really ill, have to go away or whatever. And of course, that's a subgenre of the floating heads genre, and there is this uh, great little movie on the internet that explains this genre. I hope the sound works. Uh, my name is Gavin Berliner and I design movie posters. And if you've been in a movie theater lobby in the past 15 years, you've probably seen my work. I am best known for the signature style of the floating head. Every poster presents a different challenge. You know, how big do I make the head? What shade of autumnal light should the heads be bathed in? You know, should it be brownish light or a golden light or sort of a brownish golden light? By far, my favorite head to float is Mr. Morgan Friedman. Now, he has a graceful, dignified quality to his floating head, but the minute that you show the rest of his body, that quality is lost. The only head as perfect as Morgan Freeman is Ashley Judd's head. So, if you can get Ashley Judd and Morgan Freeman's head floating together, God help you. Sometimes the studio will force me to go with just, you know, one big head on the poster, but for me, two heads is better and three heads is probably the best. And a lot of people will ask me how many heads is too many, and I'll say the more heads the better. I designed a poster for traffic that had five heads in it, and you know, a lot of people said that was too many heads. But then years later, I designed a poster for the studios that they didn't use, and it was for Crash, and it had 17 heads, one for every major character in that film. For Seabiscuit, uh, the studio said, just put Tobey Maguire's head on there. And I was like, no, this film is about a horse. And they were like, well, all right, why don't we just you know, show the, the whole horse? And I was like, no, just the head. So if the film is about a really bad guy, I like to make that really bad guy's head really big and then put the person that he's chasing really tiny in the foreground. It's important to make the more famous head slightly bigger than the less famous head. But you know you've made it when your head's gotten a little bit bigger. So today I'll be working on a poster for Righteous Kill, which is starring Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. And um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go with the floating heads. But you know, once the inspiration hits me, I am unstoppable. Creating these posters is a long and painstaking process. Um, it can take up to two years from start to finish. And sometimes they'll have to delay the release of the film so I can finish the poster. But they know a floating head poster equals box office gold. This has been a lot of fun. Can we cut? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gavin, you did it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Can we cut? Um, yeah, and then there's another phenomenon that's really um, a bit bizarre, and I call it the confused actor syndrome. Uh, 
Now, there's nothing wrong with this poster I just come back. It was shown like two slides before. But if you look at it closely, you see there's a problem because that should be Christopher Eccleston and this should be Kate Wislet. Same here, like Dustin Hoffman looks like Robert De Niro and the other way around. And what's happening here, and this is like really silly, is that contractual, contractual obligations like, mean that the most famous actor has to be listed from the left to the right. And then, uh, of course, sometimes the poster doesn't match, so you have these really weird things. Like, for example, here, Jeff Bridges is in the shadow, but his name is really in the light because it had to be to the right. And actually, it's like more important than the other one. And Ashley Judd is a black man, and Morgan Freeman is a white woman. So, And uh, it can get really ridiculous. For example, this is one of the latest movie posters I did. And we see there's like five names. So let's try to find Colin Firth. And then we have Ellen, oh, there she is, Ellen Burstyn. And then, whoa, Patricia yeah, Clarkson, Amber, whoa, Tamlin is there. And then you have Orlando Bloom. So that gets a little confusing sometimes. Okay, but so to continue, like, we see after a while that the style of the movies that are advertised with, with uh, Trajan starts to change. In the beginning, already we have like more the, like the murder mysteries, the adventure movies, the science fiction movies, but then like more the like dystopian science fiction movies that start to pretty go bad with thrillers with murders and everything. And then you get the horror movies. And now recently there's like all like kind of gorish movies with lots of blood and entrails and everything. And, um, and then even the inspirational movies, which were like originally the epic movies that used Trajan, are now straight to DVD releases. And it looks like it, Trajan has lost its original like sheen. And, and I tried to, uh, to look it up and to make this kind of graph out of it. And you see like more to the upper side of the screen is more like the high-end type of movies to lower size uh, is like more the low-end type of movies. And you see with jumps of five year, it, ha it changes. And then I already have to say that the top one, which should be the inspirational movies, most of them are not the big budget things. It's just like straight to video stuff. And you see that they try to elevate the movie beyond what it actually is by using this typeface and make it look classier than it actually is. And you see by the end 2010, there's a lot of these horror and gore movie things. And that's, that's one of the phenomenon that's also very important in type selection, is that at a certain point, people get so used and it's so uh, basic as like become the new standard that people do not select it uh, as, a, as a conscious choice anymore just because it's there. I mean, that's why also many people just use Arial or whatever because it's top of, of the font menu. So it's a whole different mindset uh, how this typeface is used. And funnily enough, like the Oscars themselves took a little while to understand that, oh, everybody's saying that Trajan is the... Oscar fund. So um, first, I'm going to show you there is no real co correlation. I mean, people say it's the Oscar fund, but there are some. The yellow dots are nominations. The red circles are actual actual Oscars won, but there's no real pattern. I mean, the Oscars themselves they understood. Oh yeah, but everybody talking about this, so we'd better use them, our own posters. So you see that in 2006 and 2008 they started using themselves. But there's change coming, and that's the very end of my talk. We have a hope for change, because we see, like, since recently, um, there's a new typeface that's being used as Gotham by Huffer and Frere Jones. And uh, we see in 2006, it appears for the first time on two posters. 2007, nothing. 2008, again, two posters. And then 2009, Kablooey. Now, what happened in 2008 that may have caused this here? Yes, Obama was elected. And this is, I think, one of the only occurrences in like social political life that has impacted on typography. I know of any other occurrence. So you have the, the iconic uh, posters by Shepard Ferry. And as those worked so well, they started the Obama camp, also used actively Gotham in their, um, uh, um, in their graphic identity. And so you see that because it was such an inspirational moment that the, 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 the graphic designers saw that as well. Oh yeah, this is now the new typeface for these inspirational movies. Now what is funny is that you see it's a very steep climb and I have the impression that Gotham is, uh, is taking the same course as Trajan did originally, but much faster because now Tr Gotham is 
after two years, where Tradition was after 10 years, because already now you have this very beautiful movie poster, also like the, the horrible, like straight to DVD type of movie posters that are already uh, set in Gotham. And of course, the best way to tell if it has become the new standard movie font is Trajan, after a while, was most of all being used for the names of the actors. So not the logo, but all the type around it. And it starts already now as well with Gotham, because I saw this really weird movie poster. Um, I don't know if you can see it sufficiently well, but these are actually two typefaces. So for the movie logo, Crazy Stupid Love, that's a conscious choice by the graphic designer. That's the typeface uh, Avenir by Frutiger, which actually looks quite a lot like Gotham, which is being used just for a tagline. So that's not the logo, it's a tagline and the actors' names. So here you already you can see that there was a conscious choice. Like the graphic designer said, I want to use Avenir for the movie logo. And then all the rest, Gotham, was just used as an afterthought because it is the standard movie poster font. So it shows up there. And then you get these situations when these two almost identical typefaces are uh, creating an, an easy tension. And then, yeah, of course, again, the Oscars, maybe they will follow. I don't know. Last Oscars, you had one for Trajan, two for Gotham. But fortunately, now, the Oscar organization was much faster and they already started using it for their own posters after two years. Thank you very much.